if I think about, you know, how maybe do some of, um, you know, people have been very successful financially, look at investments differently than conventional advice and what sort of leads to this lower bond allocation. I think there's historically uh, been this notion that, you know, I'll call it driven by the uh, investment industrial complex that volatility and risk are the same thing. And I think that is just uh, the wrong way to look at it. So you look at terms like a sharp ratio and a sharp ratio is a way that people often look at assets like hedge funds or something like that and say, you know, how good is it? You don't just say, what is the typical rate of return? But it basically defi- divides that rate of return by the volatility. So say, hey, if this thing returns 20% and this other, you know, option A returns 20, option B returns 10, but option A is twice as volatile as option B, then effectively they're just as good as each other. You can choose how much uh, risk you're willing to take, and then you get proportionally rewarded in your upside. But I think this idea of volatility and risk being the same thing, you know, I personally just don't follow that in my portfolio. I think if you have an amount of money that you don't need anywhere in the near term, let's say you don't need it until retirement, so that could be 10, 20, 30 years away, what matters to me much more is how much money am I going to have at age 70 when I want to retire and not how smooth is my path to age 20. Hello, and welcome to another episode of All the Hacks, a show about upgrading your life, money, and travel. I'm your host, Chris Hutchins. And one of the things about money that I've always been fascinated by is how wealthy people manage their finances and invest their money. And thanks to today's guest, I've been able to get a peek behind the curtain. I'm talking with Tad Fallows, who's become an expert on the topic since co-founding Long Angle, a free online community for high net worth investors. It all started when his company was acquired in 2016, and he and his co-founder were abruptly confronted with a bunch of personal finance questions. So they created Long Angle, which has grown to become a diverse group of a thousand members and offers a private online community where people can discuss a wide variety of issues from asset allocation to taxes, philanthropy, insurance, raising kids, and more. The community has no membership fees, no advertising, and no selling of member data. So I want to invite Tad to join me to shed some light on the money and investing habits of wealthy investors by walking through this year's Long Angle Portfolio Benchmarking Survey. I wanted to break down the mysterious world of alternative assets and teach you about some of the assets you might never have considered. We're also going to share some of our favorite real estate and home buying hacks and a lot more. So let's get started. Dad, welcome to the show. So excited to be here. Thank you for having me. Yeah. So I'm going to just start and ask you a question since, and we'll get into a lot of why you're an expert here, but what do you think the most common misconception is around how wealthy people, high net worth people are spending and managing their money? Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, I would say if I look at it, I don't know if this is a misconception or not, but what struck me as different um, from honestly the way I do things myself and the way I see a lot of uh, other people do things, maybe who are not in the high net worth demographic, is how light on debt they are. Um, if you, you know, we do a benchmarking survey where we look at overall how people allocate their portfolios and how much debt they hold and that sort of thing. And I would say a full 50% of the members of our group don't have any debt of any sort on their house. A quarter of them don't own a primary residence at all. And then another quarter own their residence outright. And I think it's um, 80% of members have uh, less than 25% of their assets as debt. So uh, to kind of put that in concrete terms, if you had 10 million of assets, it would mean you had less than 2 million of debt. Um, and I think if you look at general stats about the American population, et cetera, you know, you've got a much higher debt to assets ratio than you see among this group. And it's not that it's a risk averse group. You know, these are people who have started companies, work at hedge funds, work in venture capital, you know, people who are willing to take a lot of risk. Um, but I think one of the reasons they're comfortable taking that risk is they go quite light uh, on debt or leverage, however you want to phrase it. Yeah, it's fascinating. So uh, let, let's rewind. You, you brought up a few things. We're going to get to this benchmarking survey. But I just want to talk a little bit about Long Angle. So can you talk a little about what it is and why you started it? Yeah, sure. Um, so I started this group about two years ago uh, with my friend Sriram. Uh, we've been friends actually since I think freshman year of high school. I remember watching the Smurfs with him uh, after school some days. Um, but what led us to start this is that uh, shortly after college, we are both in consulting and then decided we wanted to kind of give it a try ourselves of starting our own company. Uh, so we started a software company and we ran that for about 10 years. Uh, and then, and we bootstrapped it, um, which you know means we basically didn't take any outside venture capital. Um, and in practical terms, it meant we didn't make any money ourselves or didn't take any salary out of it. We just rolled every dollar we made back into the company. 
And then after about 10 years, we were uh, fortunate enough to sell it to a strategic acquirer. Um, so it meant from a kind of a personal finance dimension, we made no money until our mid-30s. And then on one day, we got our compensation for you know, the last 10 years of effort. And so we were quite abruptly introduced to all these high net worth personal finance things, whether it's estate taxes, alternative assets, umbrella insurance, et cetera. Uh, for a variety of reasons, we didn't want to go the model of just saying, hey, you know, Goldman Sachs, here's all my money. You guys are in charge. You take it from here. Uh, we wanted to sort of manage things ourselves, but realized we had a lot to learn. So we basically wanted to set up a group of friends of ours who were all in a similar situation financially and where nobody was trying to sell each other anything. Um, and that's really still what we're doing. I think our initial expectation, this would just be you know a couple dozen friends and sort of our first or second degree circle. It ended up that need was a lot more broadly felt. And so you know, people introducing their brother, their co-founder, their board member, et cetera. Uh, we've grown to about 1,000 members um, all across the US and you know, growing share in Europe, Australia, Middle East, et cetera. Not that we are trying to have one cookie cutter member profile of, hey, you know, everybody's an early 40s software entrepreneur with two little kids. We want as much diversity as we can get, you know, professionally, geographically, et cetera, provided everybody's on the same page around the non-solicitation and confidentiality. Yeah. When I came across Long Ago, which I think I found in like a Reddit thread uh, on Fatfire, which we, could, we can get to later, is I was like, oh my gosh, this is exactly something I'm interested in, right? It's a, a community where it's private, so you can kind of be transparent, right? There's no fake profiles. There's no anonymous. Everybody goes by their name. Uh, and talk about every aspect of life. So I've been really excited to be a member. Uh, I've learned a ton. Uh, I've tried to do my best to give back and share what I know. Uh, but I'm so curious. You said you've done you know, 1,000 members. You've done probably half of those interviews at least. What kinds of things have you learned talking to all these people um, who kind of fall into this? And, and maybe talk a little about like where, where's the threshold for who's a member so people kind of get a sense of the profile of, of members of Long Angle? Uh, the bulk of people are in what banks would call the very high net worth demographic, and that means between five and thirty million of investable assets. Um, we've got maybe another fifteen or twenty percent on each side of that. Uh, we do validate that everyone's at least a qualified client, um, and the SEC defines that as having two point two million or above in investable assets. And that's really just a threshold that um, sort of governs what kind of uh, assets you're you're allowed to invest in. So those are the kind of people that I've had these discussions with. I think there's a few things that have come as surprises to me. Well, first, I would say I've just really enjoyed these interviews. I've met 500 fascinating people. And maybe the you know, biggest thing I've learned is there is no one path here. You know, we've got members who started cybersecurity companies. We have members who were you know, employee number three at Pick Your Public Company, uh, people who work at hedge funds, people who work in real estate, uh, corporate executives. People who put one paycheck into crypto back in 2011, um, you know, people who inherited money. So, say one thing is there's a lot of paths to uh, significant financial success. Um, a second thing is I would say that I don't think any of our members feel like they quote have it figured out. I think if you look on a personal level, you know, probably 80 percent of our members have little kids, and I don't think anybody feels high confidence that they know the right way to raise kids with wealth. I think there's this balance of hey. Having significant resources creates these opportunities. You know, I can get private tutors. I can help them. You know, pay for whatever activities they're interested in. Get them private gymnastics lessons, etc. So there's a lot of opportunity there. But I think there's this real tension of you know, first, I don't want to spoil my kids and just have them you know not turn into good people. And second, I don't want to deprive them of their ability to feel they've succeeded on their own terms and struggled and you know figured out the right way to do things. Um, and, you know, I think that's something where, you know, unfortunately, I don't have, hey, here's the answer about how to do it. But I do think, you know, if people are worried that they're not sure how to strike that balance, they're far from alone. And I think beyond that specific question of kids, I think, you know, even people who have achieved quite a bit of significant um, success financially, I feel like from a pure personal finance perspective, there's some big gaps in how they do things. You know, maybe it's, hey, I've heard about umbrella insurance and I know that's a thing, but I don't know what it is or how much I should buy or where to buy it. Or maybe it's, hey, I've got no trust in a state plan. Again, I know that's a thing. If I you know, keeled over tomorrow, my assets would go into probate. That ca cause all kinds of problems, but I don't know where to start or how to get my, wrap my heads around this. Or maybe I'm all in cash and can't bring myself to invest. You know, For each person, it's different. But I would say most people feel like they, they have some real gaps and don't have it figured out. 
And finally, the last thing that actually just gave me a lot of personal comfort is I would say 80 or 90% of people feel like they are the one sucker really paying their taxes. I think there's this impression of, hey, you know, everybody out there is, you know, moving to Puerto Rico and doing 1031 exchanges and doing all these clever things that ends up with effective no tax rate. But the significant majority of people feel like, hey, you know, I'm paying 30% plus in effective taxes and, you know, I uh, haven't figured out the way around it. Which, you know, personally, I think is actually not a bad thing uh, and just makes me feel better about being in that same situation to know that most people are, are paying their share. Well, one, now I feel a lot better. I'm also paying my share. And, uh, you know, as much as I love to find the, the tax hacks, it seems like, you know, it makes me feel better. I guess unless I talk to people in real estate that seem to always say they're not paying taxes. Um, I thought the misconception you might say at the beginning was that, you know, everyone thinks that the wealthy have it all figured out. And if there's something I've learned uh, being in the group, it's like people are open about the fact that they haven't figured it out. Um, and I like that. And, you know, someone listening might say, well, you know, is it, is it just staying within the bubble of the wealthy and all this knowledge? And, and I think things like this, and we're going to talk about your benchmarking survey, like hopefully are an opportunity to kind of get some of that information out. But I know that where they're not a closed door ecosystem, you just might not, people might not be as open to sharing. So it's, it's this catch 22 of, if you made it open for anyone to come, you might not actually get the conversation going. But if you close it, how do you get that information out? Any thoughts on ways to share some of the knowledge that's coming out of a group like this with more people? So people that aren't there have a higher likelihood of getting to that group in the future? Yeah, I think it's a fantastic question. Um, and I think you're right. There is this tension there. So, you know, one of the guiding principles we put in place is this idea of confidentiality, um, because we do think that having a real names policy and people actually, you know, being who they purport to be is really important, but people are just not going to open up about, you know, it's one of those things that people just don't talk about money. And I would say at most wealth demographics, that's not unique to the high net worth. Um, so I think you know, there is a bit of a tension there, as you mentioned. Um, as you said, for example, we do this uh, annual benchmarking study. And what we do there is we ask all of our members to put in a spreadsheet across, you know, 60 some different asset classes how their portfolios break down, you know, in percentage terms, not, not absolute dollars, but across these asset classes. And then we synthesize all that data, normalize it, correlate it with a bunch of dimensions and create a report around that. That's something that actually, you know, we publicize and share with everybody. So anybody who, uh, you know, wants that data um, is certainly welcome to access it. I think going forward, it's a great idea to think about other ways that we can, you know, look to share things that don't compromise confidentiality. I think there's always going to be, you know, certain things and, you know, first person anecdotes that just can't be shared. But I think a lot of this, we're looking to do more kind of synthesized and aggregated data. And, and um, that's not something that I would look to, uh, you know, prevent uh, being more broadly disseminated. We do this uh, once a week. We'll do a, we call it a mini benchmark um, in the forum. We'll ask one question, just give four possible answers. And that can be anything from, you know, uh, what do you expect interest rates are going to top out at? How much allocation do you have to emerging market securities? You know, uh, do you use a wealth manager or not? And I think that's a great idea. We can maybe just tweet the results of those out to, you know, anybody who follows us on Twitter. You know, the, the one about wealth manager, actually, you'd asked earlier, what what might be you know surprising? Um, and one thing also that's surprising to me is I personally don't use an RIA or wealth manager. I had been under the impression that I was sort of the oddball in that approach. But actually, if we look at overall membership, only about forty percent of people have any sort of third party, whether it's a uh, multifamily office, RIA, wealth manager, et cetera. About sixty percent of them do not. Um, and I think it mostly comes down to the biggest thing is probably just this fee structure of paying you know half a percent or one percent of your assets every year. Just people. Both, I think, don't really like the idea of paying a percentage as opposed to just paying, you know, straight dollars. So like, hey, I pay my lawyer by the hour, I pay my account by the hour. Why can't I pay my wealth manager by the hour? And then just the absolute number, you know, if someone has $10 million paying 1% of that means you're paying $100,000 a year, which is just quite a bit of money. So that, that was another surprise to me is that I was not in the minority of saying that I'm just going to do things myself. I think if I look at our membership, you get to a certain level and, you know, I aspire to be there, but not there myself. If you're, you know, over say, you know, 50 or hundred million, I think it just starts to get to this level of complexity that even just managing the paperwork and dealing with the tax returns, you really can't do that uh, by yourself unless it's really your hundred percent job. So people do hire and help to that. But below that kind of level, I'd say most people, uh, at least in our group are, are managing everything themselves. And managing it yourselves doesn't mean you don't have an assistant or you don't have a bookkeeper and you don't have someone that files your taxes. It just means you're not paying someone a percentage of all of your assets to manage your investment. 
Yeah, that's exactly right. I would say almost everybody has a CPA who's doing their taxes, and that can be, you know, a very reasonable amount of money. You know, somebody can be making $2 million a year and only pay 1000 or 2000 a year for somebody to file their taxes. It does not need to be a backbreaking amount of money. And I actually think at a certain point, it's just silly not to hire somebody else to do it because you can have all the good intentions of the world, but it's really easy to misread the tax code at a certain level and either you know underpay or overpay. And I'm not sure which is worse. I don't think people want to be doing either one. So certainly, as you're saying, yes, uh, bookkeepers and assistants and that sort of thing. But I think just this principle of saying, I'm going to pay somebody you know, uh, half a percent or a percent a year just to tell me to put something into a 60-40 index fund uh, is... Now, I will say our group tends to be younger, as I said, you know, in their 30s and 40s, and overwhelmingly, you know, probably 95% of people didn't grow up with this kind of wealth, but uh, generated it themselves at some point along the way. So I think probably has a relatively high, you know, dose of self-confidence in their ability to do it. So probably a bit of selection bias there, but um, it's not a unconventional approach. One thing when it comes to taxes, even if you don't want to hire a CPA forever, I would encourage everyone to hire someone for one year. Um, and, or even I found that as part of a, I guess, a sales tactic, most of the accountants I've talked to, to file taxes, when you get to know you, they say, Hey, why don't I ret- review your last year's return? And you're still within the window of being able to refile if you uh, mess something up. And I wouldn't say I found any glaring mistakes from when I was doing it myself, but even when I hired uh, a firm that was kind of not that great, the next firm I ended up hiring was like, well, here's a couple things you could have done differently. and so. I found that at at almost all levels, hiring someone to do this, it, you know, pays for itself in what they're able to understand and and file for you. So I, I think that if I filed my taxes myself, forgetting the time it would take, I would actually uh, end up not not filling out the right things uh, and ending up making less at the end of the year than I would if I paid someone. I agree, and I think there's also value to have somebody throughout the years you're trying to make decisions you can bounce ideas off of. You know, so for example, I. Uh, we own a home in Southern California we used to live in, and we've moved since then. And you know, I'd sort of like to sell it because it's just sort of a hassle to manage. But then I had concerns about, okay, if I sell it, is that going to have big tax implications? And having somebody who I've worked with for a number of years knows my whole situation, so I can send her an email saying, hey, you know, I see these options here. I could sell this and do a 1031 exchange and then you know, defer sort of indefinitely paying taxes on it, or I could just sell it, but I'm worried I'm going to have this big gain that's going to be taxed under California tax rates, and it's going to sort of wipe out the whole point of doing it. And somebody who has that whole context, you know, she was able to easily identify, say, okay, well, you've got, you know, these passive losses you haven't been able to take, and you can net these out. And really, it's not just a matter at the end of the year getting the accounting right, but she was able to help me make better decisions along the way and say, hey, you know, here's what the tax implication will be when you're filing your returns next year if you do this, but here's this other way to structure it that is just as good economically, but is going to be a lot smarter way to go about it. You mentioned the benchmarking survey. And one of the things I think is really interesting is that so many of these benchmarking surveys exist. If you search Schwab, RIA benchmarking, you get a lot of them, but they all are tied to some brokerage firm or some RIA. And so the results end up looking very similar to whatever that investment advisor is recommending their clients do. And so I don't feel like it's as practically useful um, for anyone other than like, if I want to steal clients from this RIA, I now know what their clients look like. Uh, But your benchmarking survey, like you said, 60% of people don't even have wealth managers is really fascinating. So I thought maybe it'd be fun to go through some of the learnings. I think anyone listening would certainly be you know, educated in many ways about what are what are all these people doing? How are they structuring their portfolios? What are they thinking about debt, leverage, all this stuff? So maybe we could just run through it. Uh, like you mentioned, it'll be available. So I'll just link to it in the show notes if people want to go uh, take a look at it and follow along. But maybe we could just walk through it and talk about it. You know, the way that we run this, to be clear on that, is that we share it with all of our members once a year. We uh, share the survey and we define something like 60 to 65 different asset classes and ask people to uh, put in how their personal portfolio is allocated across these different kinds of assets and these different kinds of debt. Then we gather all that data together. And we also know a lot of other demographic data about our members, You know, how old they are, what was their source of wealth, um, where do they live, all of that sort of thing. And we now have a big enough N that you, we can actually correlate across those things and not just say, okay, on average, people have this much money invested in private equity, but say, okay, you know, compared to people who have you know, are younger or older or um, more or less money in total, you know, how does that uh, affect their allocation to uh, different asset classes? Um, So that's sort of how we go about it. 
I would say, you know, I'm not, I know that radio is not the best medium for talking about a lot of numbers. So I'm not going to get into exactly what percentage point to each one, but happy to talk about sort of a few high level takeaways here. As I said, I'd encourage people to, to look at the link if they want to uh, see more details. I'd say at the highest level in terms of how people's portfolios are allocated, it is roughly one third into public stocks or public equities. Um, so that's anything, whether you know U.S. or international, you know, buying Microsoft, Apple, et cetera, uh, mostly via index funds, but it could also be individual shares. It's about a quarter into equity and real estate, whether that's somebody's primary residence or whether that is you know investment properties, vacation homes, uh, commercial buildings, warehouses, what have you. And then about a quarter into um, alternative assets, which could either be um, you know, private companies they hold, could be crypto. Uh, we can get a little bit more later into the show into what alts are, but about a quarter into alternative assets. And then the rest, about you know 15% into uh, cash and bonds. Um, and in terms of changes that we've seen over the last year, uh, you can see there's a big drop in terms of shares in public equities that went from about half of people's portfolio down to just a third. And what made up the difference was more in real estate and more in alternative assets. And do you think that some of that is just the market was down a, a pretty significant amount between years? Or do you have any kind of qualitative data around this to understand how much of it was market driven versus portfolio structure driven? Yeah, I, I think it was both. Um, I don't know if I can break down exact percentages, but yeah, the fact is the market's down, you know, something like 20% uh, over the last year, whereas the real estate market's gone down a little bit lately, but it's probably up. Um, and, you know, uh, alts have also done well. So I think some of it's market driven. But yeah, your question about, you know, uh, qualitatively, uh, I can say with confidence that people, and, you know, partly because we asked in the survey, what are you personally doing to change your allocation? And that is something people are intentionally doing of, feeling like the environment that um, we were in before, you know, is not the one we're in now. And so something like, you know, real estate, for example, two years ago, that was probably a fantastic buy. You had two and a half percent debt that you could get on things and, you know, very reasonable expectations of inflation at two to three times that level. Um, so that was, you know, a real smart move to do. I'd say, you know, today, something like real estate is less attractive. Again, higher interest rates tend to make public stocks less attractive. So I think you know we are seeing people intentionally trying to uh, increase their allocation, especially uh, to alternatives. You know, and then um, beyond t a couple of other sort of to dive into the details, things that people may find surprising. Uh, I think I mentioned earlier on here that about a quarter of our members don't own their own home, and I would say for almost everybody that is by choice. It's not a matter of you know if you got five million dollars you could afford to buy a house, but again, asking people qualitatively, you know, why don't you buy a home? I would say it probably falls in two categories. There's a set of people who just don't want to live in any one place. You know, these often tend to be the people without kids, but they're you know nomads and say, okay, I want to be in Mexico City for the next three months. Then I want to be in Switzerland, and you know, I just don't see a point in owning a house if I do that. And then there's also a lot of people who just don't want the sort of mental burden, the time burden, you know, the financial risk, et cetera, associated with owning. They would rather just rent and know I'm going to pay this. And if the lights need to be changed, the plumbing breaks, the roof leaks. That's not my problem. I'm just going to call the landlord and tell him to deal with it. Um, so, I, you know, uh, that's a big thing. And then if you look at the three quarters of people who do own a home, again, a quarter of those uh, don't have a mortgage on it. So you have pretty much fully half of members uh, without a mortgage. So uh, I found that interesting. Um, and another thing on the personal real estate is that uh, leaving aside the caveat I had that there's a material percentage of people who don't own a home, um, if you look at you know those who do, up to about $50 million, the home continues to be a pretty significant um, piece of people's net worth. If you get somebody who's a billionaire, of course, their primary residence is probably not a big part of their portfolio, but somebody could have over $25 million and still have you know 10 or 15% of their net worth in their home. So that's something else that's interesting to me is how much uh, people's primary residence value continues to scale uh, along with their net worth. So I want to just point out, you know, I'm a big fan of uh, the fact that Ramit Sethi spends a lot of time telling the world uh, that renting is, is like not the worst thing in the world. Uh, and I love that you're seeing that here. And this is another message that's reinforced. I know so many people that think that throw, renting a house is just throwing away money. And I couldn't, I mean, I, I've spent a lot of money on property tax. I've spent a lot of money on uh, insurance. I've spent a lot of, there, there's a lot of costs that come with owning a home that end up getting thrown away. Uh, mortgage interest being another one. So I just, I, I want to make sure we pause for a second and reinforce the fact that uh, renting is not a decision that is something that means you won't make money. It means you're throwing all your money away. 
I've done the break even analysis and like built spreadsheets to figure it out. You know, if you look at the costs and you look at the cost of mortgage interest and all this stuff, I generally think that if you're not in a house for more than five years, all the money that you're spending to buy a home and the brokerage fees, everything, you're also throwing away and you actually would have been better off renting. Now, there are a lot of factors that play into this that, you know, who knows if rents are going to rise, who knows what happens to mortgage rates and home prices and appreciation. But my rule of thumb has always been uh, less than five years owning actually doesn't make sense. And if you think, oh, I could stay in the place I am for the next 10 years and you buy a place, but you buy a place that's so big that it will work five to 10 years from now, but it's actually way bigger than you need for the next one to five years. You're effectively overpaying. And if you were renting, instead, you might rent a one or two bedroom. But now because you want to adhere to this five-year rule, you buy a four bedroom then you're also still going to come out behind because for the next three, four or five years, you would have saved so much money renting the one to two bedroom. So I I just try to take every opportunity I can to reinforce the fact that uh, buying is not the end all best, best path forward for everyone. And renting certainly, while you don't get to recoup that money, you also have a lot of expenses associated with buying that you don't get to recoup. Yeah, I I agree with that. And I think the other thing I would say is when you're looking at real estate, not only should you look at how long should I stay there, but it really matters what is the economic environment I'm buying in. And by that, I primarily actually mean what's the interest rate you're paying. If you buy a house in cash, it's not a bad investment, but nobody is becoming, you know, a multimillionaire by buying property in cash. The reason that real estate often turns out to be a very good uh, investment is that you're putting in 20, 25% of your own money and 75, 80% of somebody else's money. In that case, you know, if it goes up 5%, you're seeing a 25% return on your money. And that's great. And you know, I would say over the past five years, I've actually personally been buying a lot of real estate and trying to take on as much of that leverage as possible. But that is not a universal answer. That was the case when interest rates were down at 2 or 3%. And I think anybody who is looking at government policy and that sort of thing knew that inflation was going to be a lot higher than that. That's not the environment we're in anymore. You know, rates have gone up three percent over you know the last number of months, and you know you're seeing I think the average highest average mortgage rates we've seen in the last twenty years. So you can still take on debt, but you're paying way more for that, and so you're just it's unlikely to be that same wealth generator now. So I think you need to look at your own situation, but also just look at what's the overall economic environment. And this doesn't just go for real estate; this goes for other asset classes. You know, if you look at bonds two years ago. I didn't hold any. In my opinion, that was a terrible investment. If you look at something that's a 30-year bond that's yielding 2%, there's no uncertainty. Mathematically, if you hold that to maturity over the next 30 years, you're going to earn 2% a year. And there's near, uh, near total certainty that inflation is going to be higher than that. So you're basically locking yourself into losing money over 30 years. Now, that environment, by the flip side, has become a lot more attractive. You know, Personally, I still don't buy bonds because I'm not that compelled by a 5% rate, a 4% rate, but that's way better than the 2% you had before. So I think across any asset class, there's not one universal, hey, here's the right answer. Here's a portfolio that makes sense. You have to be somewhat reactive to the situation as you see it. And you know, unfortunately, you only get to sort of live your life once. And it may be that ideally, you know, when you're 28, you'd like to buy a home, but it's not a great environment to buy a home. You just have to kind of react to that fact, but you need to look at a combination of what's going on internally and externally for you. I will also add right now, because I know there are people, especially in my friend group that are like, you know, I finally have the money for the down payment, but interest rates are so high. I will say two things. One, I have noticed even in the Bay Area that there've been a lot of price decreases. So, you know, if you factor in the fact that you might get the house a lot cheaper than you would have a year ago, uh, that could be an impact. And then the second is you, you don't, you're not, you're never locked into 7%, right? If you get a mortgage right now and it is 7% and, you know, hopefully, you know, for the sake of those people that that comes down quickly, but like if mortgage rates drop back down in three years, you can always uh, go ahead and refinance. And so funny enough, I had been doing some calculus when I, or, or calculations at least, uh, when I was trying to decide whether we got a 30-year mortgage or a 10-year mortgage. And I was looking at the break-even point on the 10-year mortgage. And it's not 10 years, right? If in my worst case scenario math, I was saying, okay, well, at the end of the 10-year period, rates go up to 7%. And now I'm paying you know, way higher than two and a half or whatever I would have done on the 30-year mortgage. And the break-even point was still like 12 or 13 years. And so what that meant was, if I had gotten a 10-year mortgage and paid, you know, let's say, half a percent lower than my 30-year fixed for 10 years, and then it rose up to 7%, 
the savings I got for those first years actually was was totally made up for by e- having even having to pay 7% for three years. So if you inverse that and say, if I get a mortgage now and for three years I have to pay 7% and then after that I can refinance, like the net effect over you know a decade or more is not going to be as impactful and probably, and I have not done any math, this is not financial advice, but probably not going to outweigh the fact that you might be able to get the house at a significantly better deal right now because so many people are scared off by mortgage rates. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. The only other hack I would add uh, in the world of buying a house, so I brought bought three uh, houses uh, since my wife and I have gotten married, and we have followed the same strategy on all of them, and I've been very happy with the person purchase on each one. And that has basically been looking for houses that have been on the market for a year, two years, and they came on way too high. Nobody wanted it. And so then after a while, they started cutting, and they kept cutting and kept cutting. And to the point where we bought it, in each case, it was about uh, 30% below where they'd originally brought it on. And I am confident that any one of those, if they had brought it on just at the right price at the beginning, it would have sold right away, it would have sold for more than we paid. But you start to get this dynamic where a house just gets stale. And I remember, you know, most recent one we bought, it was uh, actually a vacation house in Southern California near my brother. I was really, you know, excited about this opportunity. We'd been working with a realtor for a while there and, you know, couldn't find anything that sort of was what we were looking for as price we could afford, et cetera. To find my wife, you know, she was on Zillow, said, hey, you know, what about this one? This looks amazing. This looks, you know, has great ocean views, has exactly what we're looking for. And, you know, this price seems super reasonable. And we talked to our broker. She said, no, nah, you don't want to see that. It's been on the market forever. And so we pushed her, you know, like, really do want to see her. She's like, ah, it's hard to show, you know, tenants there are messy. I was like, why on earth would I care the tenants there are messy? Like, I'm not looking for tenants. I'm looking for a property. Anyway, you know, we finally got into, into it, finally saw it, and we bought it. And then, you know, afterwards, she's saying, I don't know why this thing was here. You know, this, this thing should have gone in a heartbeat at, you know, 20% higher than this. So I think, it, you know, that is a strategy. As I said, it wasn't a one-off. It's been all three houses we bought. Just this idea of a stale house is no longer hot. And then, you know, people just get spooked by it. They say, hey, if it's been there for a year or two, there must be something fundamentally wrong with this house. There's a reason nobody else wants it. And then you just get these sellers who keep having to do these little salami slices of, you know, cutting, you know, 3%, 5% at a time and end up uh, well below the market. My two house buying hacks, uh, one that we've done for both, one that we've done for one, was earlier in our careers, we were like, well, we... We knew that we wanted to be in a house for a long period of time if we wanted to buy it because you kind of needed that for the math to work. But we also didn't want to pre-buy space we didn't need. So we found a house that had three bedrooms, but it had a private entrance for one of the bedrooms. And we con- basically converted that to a studio and rented it out. We locked the door from the inside between that bedroom and the rest of our house. It didn't have a kitchen, but you know, in the Bay Area, there are lots of young people who either work at a company that provides them all their meals or don't mind cooking and you know, in a microwave and going out to eat and all of that. And so for almost a decade, we rented a room out in our house. And then right about the time we were about to have our first daughter, we were like, you know what, we need that third bedroom now. And we are in a financial position to not need the rental income anymore uh, to make the ha- make the mortgage payments. Now, all of a sudden, we we're like, now we just upgraded from a two bedroom to a three bedroom, but we didn't have to move. And we had that extra income. So right now, that could be a great opportunity. And it, it seems so crazy to me, or, or at the time, it seemed so crazy to me to think, what if it didn't have a door? Now, I, now I, knowing everything I know, the cost to like cut a hole in a house and put a door is probably actually not as much as I thought. So I think early on, I was like only looking at houses that were set up for this. Knowing what I know now, you could look for any house. And relative to the cost to buy a house, the cost to cut a hole and put a door is actually going to be pretty insignificant. So... It doesn't even have to be perfectly situated for this. It could just you know, be perfectly situated for you to make that modification. And then the second one, which most people have told me is a terrible idea, but I've done it twice and I like it. So this is, again, not, a, not advice for you, but um, I've gone to a house that we found the house we liked ourselves. We found it on Redfin or Zillow or somewhere. We went and looked at it. And then we convinced the selling agent to be the, our agent also, which is called a dual agency. And so the seller's agent now represents both the buyer and the seller. They have to get permission from the seller to do this. And if you find someone that is, you know, you reasonably would trust to act fair and impartial because they're legally required to do that. So you you have both the law, but also, you know, you want someone that you feel like can ethically handle that circumstance. You end up in a situation which they make 
two commissions if you buy the house, and they make one commission if anyone else buys the house. So I will say they are very motivated for you to buy the house. Um, and so I think in the, as a seller, I don't know if I would ever do this. Uh, maybe I would do it if, if I could agree that the agent would rebate me a significant part of that commission back. But as a seller, I, want, you know, I, want, I don't want someone to be motivated by one buyer. I want someone to be motivated by the highest price. As a buyer, I would much rather want an agent who's motivated to sell to me than anyone else. And so in both scenarios, I think we, got an, we were able to close a, and a purchase contract before other higher offers came in, in some cases by hours, um, and in some cases by, by, by a day. But you know, we were able to make an offer on the house we're in now before it went on the market and, and have it accepted. And the backup offers that came in were higher than our offers, uh, at least as best I understand it. So um, that's my little hack, which I wouldn't do as a seller, but as a buyer has worked well. I like that hack. And you know, I would build on it. I think that works the way you did it. That works great in a competitive market where the challenge for you is to actually get the buy. I think if you say, hey, maybe today's market's not so hot, you know, I've got time, it's more of a buyer's market or maybe a more balanced market. But I think you can easily flip that around. And I haven't done this myself, but I've ha- I have um, uh, a friend who's done this several times where he'll put in an offer and he'll write into his offer, you know, I'm not represented by an agent. And part of my offer is that uh, the seller is no longer paying a 6% commission. They're only paying a 3% commission. So he's basically saying, hey, when you look at my offer here, and maybe you know I'm bidding nine hundred seventy thousand. My competitor is bidding a million, but you, Mister Owner, are going to net the same amount because I am uh, explicitly stating that that commission goes back to the seller. Um, then I think you know you can basically uh, get a lower price on it. Again, it's not something I've done, but I think it's the flip side. If it's not a competitive market, if it's more of a buyer's market, you can use that as a way to to uh, find a lower price that's uh, not going to hurt your seller. Yeah, when we did it, we actually the first time, the second time this didn't work, but the first time we convince the agent to rebate the, the 1% of their commission back to us. Meaning one of the 6%, not 1% of their overall thing. So, you know, we were able to bid a little higher because we were getting it back. You, I, I've never thought about what you just described, which is like, just take the commission out and then you can offer lower. So those are fun hacks, especially if you're buying a house in this market and want to try to find a way to get it, get the best deal. But I want to jump back in. So we were talking about real estate uh, as part of your portfolio. We talked about what happened to stocks Let's talk about a few of the other interesting things. And I think alternative assets is one. Um, maybe because I have a lot of questions there, we could start with cash and then jump to alternatives because I think we could spend a bit more time there. Anything you learned particularly interesting about cash or, or anything else that we, we kind of missed, missed when we talked earlier? Yeah, I would say that you know if you think of conventional financial advice, it would probably look like a 60-40 portfolio. 60% stocks, 40% bonds. If I look at our typical member, and so again, we're talking about people with you know, 5 to 30 million, their typical portfolio is only 15% stocks plus, uh, or sorry, cash plus bonds altogether. There's just been very little appetite historically uh, for those instruments. Now, that could be different. Now, the interest rates have you know, tripled over the uh, past number of months. If we run this next year, we might find that bonds become more interesting. But to date, I think people keeping very little ca- uh, cash and bonds. And part of the flip side of that is probably not having much debt either. It's saying, hey, I'm not going to take a lot of risk here and put a lot of leverage in my portfolio. But by the same token, what I'm putting my money into, I want to have a high expected return. I'm not happy with an expected return of 2%. I want to get you know 10% or 20% or, or something like that. Um, and I think part of this comes down to, you know, apologies if I'm taking a little field from your question here. But if I think about you know, how maybe do some of, um, you know, people have been very successful financially look at investments differently than conventional advice and what sort of leads to this lower bond allocation. I think there's historically uh, been this notion that, you know, I'll call it driven by the uh, investment industrial complex that volatility and risk are the same thing. And I think that is just uh, the wrong way to look at it. So you look at terms like a sharp ratio and a sharp ratio is a way that people often look at assets like hedge funds or something like that and say, you know, how good is it? You don't just say, what is the typical rate of return? But it basically defi- divides that rate of return by the volatility. So say, hey, if this thing returns 20% and this other, you know, option A returns 20, option B returns 10, but option A is twice as volatile as option B, 
then effectively they're just as good as each other. You can choose how much uh, risk you're willing to take, and then you get proportionally rewarded in your upside. But I think this idea of volatility and risk being the same thing, you know, I personally just don't follow that in my portfolio. I think if you have an amount of money that you don't need anywhere in the near term, let's say you don't need it until retirement, so that could be 10, 20, 30 years away, what matters to me much more is how much money am I going to have at age 70 when I want to retire? And not how smooth is my path to age 20. So, you know, uh, not that I don't care at all. Everyone, of course, is somewhat emotional, is not going to be happy about seeing, you know, a million dollars go down to 100,000, then jump up to 5 million. But you're much better off ending up at 3 million than having it just, you know, in a bond going from a million to a million one to a million two and ending up only a million and a half in 30 years rather than the 3 million. And so this idea that, um, you know, risk is very real, but I see risk much more as, what is the chance that in the end, I'm going to have a permanent loss on this, a permanent impairment of capital? And these are not new concepts for me. You know, Warren Buffett talks about it in these same terms, the, the risk that you permanently lose this money, not just how much does it bounce around it, um, in the interim. And so I think that that would be something that I would, you know, encourage everybody um, to think about is, you know, especially if you do work with a financial advisor, um, you know, I'll, I'll give an anecdote. Uh, when we sold our company, and I was talking to a number of financial advisors, one of the you know big name, high profile banks, I was talking with um, uh, actually a good friend of mine who works there. He's a wealth manager, and he was sort of giving their pitch. He said, "You know what we can do for you? We can give you half the return on the stock market at a quarter of the volatility." And I said, well, "Why would I want that? Why don't you give me twice the return on the stock market at the normal volatility?" And he just looked at me like I was crazy. Like, no, it's not what we do. We give you lower, lower returns and lower volatility. And I, and you know, I think that's fine if you, if you have a known need for this, you know, if you're sending your kid to college in two years and that money needs to be there and it's no good for you that you'll have money in 10 years, well, then you shouldn't take risk with it. But I think, you know, a lot of your listeners are probably, you know, earning good salaries in an active savings phase. And, you know, if they're younger and earlier in their careers are giving me a savings phase for decades to come. There's really, I would encourage them, unless that they know that they personally just don't have the risk appetite and are going to panic and sell in a downturn, um, unless that that's the case, just not to be as, as worried about near-term volatility. And I think, you know, there is, um, I think there is less panic selling than people are led to believe. I think it's in the interest of the financial advisors to sort of say, hey, you know, if you're, if you're going into these things by yourself and, you know, you're going these risky asset classes... You are going to panic the next time you know a dot com bubble happens, or next time a great financial crisis happens. But that's not universally true. That that's some people, but uh, that that's not everybody. I think there's a lot of people who can just say, "I'm going to set on autopilot. I save a thousand bucks a month, and I never never look at that, and I just check my portfolio once a year and, and hope it goes up." I mean, the good news. This is not good news for our our accounts, but in the last I don't know three years, we've had three. We've had you know. What happened when the pandemic started? People that were invested in equity saw their portfolio crash, and you can ask yourself, "How did I react?" And if you were able to, you know, hold back your, uh, you know, fear and not react, well, now you've been able to test yourself. Now we're again in like a double-digit, you know, twenty-plus percent uh, correction in the stock market, and then anyone who's held, you know, basically any amount of crypto in the last handful of years has probably had a, a separate, sometimes correlated, sometimes uncorrelated, complete, you know. 50% haircut in, in that market. So I think a, a benefit to young people today, uh, you know, I'm going to pretend I'm young right now, uh, is that, you know, these things were things that some people didn't see for 10, 20 years. And now, you know, we've, we've seen two in the public stock market, you know, in the last two years. And so people have really gotten to understand how they feel and even understand how they felt the first one and now see how it changed in the second one. And I think that's something that historically people have needed, you know, maybe 20 years to find out. And now, you know, we're fortunate, I guess, maybe not right now with our portfolios being down, but we're at least fortunate that in, in a very short period of time, we've gotten two opportunities to see how we would react and what happens and understand our own appetite for, for risk and, and short-term volatility. And for me, you know, I don't love logging in uh, and seeing that my portfolio is down 20% and seeing, but, but the portfolio is down 20%. I don't need now. So, you know, you can get caught up and say, oh man, my net worth is down, but it's like, I, I'm not trying to withdraw this money to spend it now. So maybe it doesn't matter. And one thing we didn't touch on before we talk about cash and alternatives is the balance between indexes and individual stock investing. Uh, and, and I'm a little curious what you've seen in the long angle community with this survey of 
of people kind of trying to pick stocks and pick winners, which is, you know, you know, I know often uh, a thing that people are told, you know, you can't do, but then you're like, well, Warren Buffett's doing it. What, what are people in the community doing here? Yeah, I would say they're probably picking a lot fewer individual stocks than you would expect. Uh, you know, we we did ask of your total public equity exposure, how much of that is in index funds versus individual stocks. And, um, you know, the significant majority is index funds. And I would say those individual stocks, they often tend to be employer stocks. So, hey, you know, I was a employee of X company before it went public and I've got a lot of shares or I just get every year as part of my compensation package, I guess, a certain number of shares and haven't gotten around to sell them. So I would say that there is not a lot of individual stock picking. Now, of course, nothing's universal. There are the guys who love it. But in general, I'd say that for their public equity exposure, people go diversified. Now, the one plug I will put in favor of individual stock picking, and I do a little bit of this, not that I think I'm great, but mostly for fun, is to your point around, hey, the market went down 20%. I feel 20% poorer. I think that's largely a perception of people's relationship with a stock is just this number on the screen. But the more you're actually thinking about, I own you know, one one millionth of a percent of Apple, and that's the thing I own. I don't own a share of Apple that today is worth 100, tomorrow is 140, but I own this little share on their future income. You sort of know intuitively, Apple didn't just become 20% or 30% less valuable. This is just sort of the market pinging around. Or you know, more extreme case, Facebook did not lose 75% of its value over the last six months, even though the price went down 75%. So I actually think it's not that harmful if you're somebody who you know, enjoys it. I wouldn't just put all your eggs in one basket. But if you want to buy you know, a sort of balance of 20, 30 different stocks, you're almost certainly just going to track the overall index. But if either you know you find that a fun diversion, it's something that you enjoy, and maybe you that's like a form of spending. So rather than going on a fancy vacation, you're you know spending by investing in these stocks. It's not a bad thing financially, but especially if it makes you more comfortable in a drawdown because you can really just look at the profit and loss statement and say, hey, you know, P and G sold three percent more tithe this year than last year. So I don't really care that that the market's down because you know they're still paying their dividends, they're still making tide, Exxon's still pumping oil. I think that can actually be really helpful. People to sort of ride out some of this volatility. And you know, to your point about Warren Buffett, um, you know, and picking stocks, I think that's exactly how he talks about it. He says, you know, don't look at my market to market. Just look at what is the operating cash flow of the businesses we own, and sort of do a look through basis. I own five percent of Apple, and you know, that made X billion dollars of profit next year. So that's what I think it's worth, not you know what I could get if I happen to sell my Apple shares today. Let's move to the the topic of alternatives because I think it's something that seems so mysterious to people. And in some ways, even just through the long angle community, I've started learning like, wow, even I felt like there was a lot more that I knew. So maybe if you could give a little bit of an overview to people listening on on what you even mean by alternatives, what does that whole space look like? And then we could talk a little bit about how to think about them, when to think about them, where to get them, what kinds and, and all of that. Yeah, awesome. Well, I'm super excited to talk about this. I think this is just a really interesting asset class. So first of all, I'll say alternatives is a very broad term. At its highest level, it means really anything that is not stocks, bonds, cash, or real estate. Now, some people will call real estate an alternative, but I don't think it really belongs there. But it's basically everything else. So you know, when I talk about it here, I'm sure that you know, you'll have somebody writing in listing 10 different alternatives I left out, because pretty much anything you can think of putting your money into, you can define as an alternative. But it's everything except those conventional ones. Now, you know, to sort of make that a little bit more concrete, they tend to have a few, share a few characteristics. I would say they tend to be less regulated. You know, when you're buying stocks or buying bonds, you have this whole infrastructure of the federal government and the Securities Exchange Commission and all these rules and courts that make sure that you have full information and that, you know, that every company has to publish their quarterly earnings or else the CEO and the board's going to be sued and that sort of thing. And there's a lot to ensure transparent information. And effectively efficient pricing. This is part of the reason that you can just go out there and sort of buy whatever stocks you want to. And if you buy enough of them, you're probably just going to track the index because there's good information. But there is a lot less regulation and a lot less information on alternatives. Um, and you know, in terms of less information, um, I can go out there today and find a list of every publicly traded company in the U.S. And that's just an objective factual list. If you want, if you said, hey. What is every alternative out there? There is no list you can look at. You know, you can do Google searches and say, okay, what's every hedge fund out there? And you'll find different lists, but you know, it's only going to be people who opt into that hedge fund index. And also they tend to be usually less liquid. That's not universal. Something like crypto, I can go sell it tomorrow. It's a very liquid market, or maybe, you know, foreign currencies, I can go sell those tomorrow, very liquid. 
but a lot of them tend to be less liquid. Just means you know it's a, a higher friction to buy and sell and longer holding periods. Now, this idea of being less regulated, less transparent, less liquid, that sounds bad, but it's not necessarily bad. I think that's that's the there is both a good and bad on it. The bad is that it is a lot more dangerous to be a naive investor in alternatives. The good is that if you actually know what you're talking about, there's a lot more opportunity to sustainably have high rates of return. You know, if somebody tells you they're going to buy public stocks and return 25% a year consistently with low risk, I would just run away from that. It's just not possible. You know, the market is efficient. Any good news, good information just gets arbitraged away very quickly. But in the alternative space, you can find a little niche um, where if you really understand it, you know the people you're partnering with that are good, because it's not transparent, because it's not liquid, you don't have trillions of dollars of capital flooding into that particular niche and arbitraging away the whole opportunity. You can have a uh, consistent, sustainable uh, source of, it's called alpha, or just uh, consistent you know, above uh, market rate returns. And so I think it's extremely attractive. And personally, I'm doing most of my investing there, but it's one where you have to be more careful because you can either make a lot or lose a lot of money depending on, on how you do it. Um, if you want, I'd be happy to kind of get a little bit more into what some of the specific you know, kinds of alternatives are, classes, and you know, uh, what, to, what to expect in each of those. Yeah, I think that'd be really helpful and, and, and include some examples of some of the kind of interesting ones that maybe people would have never thought of as an investment. And again, with the caveat that I'm sure I'm going to be leaving out more than I mentioned here, I would probably put them into four big groups. I think the first one is some sort of equity, some sort of ownership in a business. Now, typically people think of stocks, you know, I'm buying Microsoft or Google, but that's really only the biggest five or 10,000 companies in the country. There's another multiple millions of companies in the country that are not publicly traded. And so they're all accessed, you know, through some kind of alternative. And within there, I think there's some really interesting asset classes. Maybe people are most familiar with angel investing. And that really means somebody just, you know, it's basically at an idea stage. You've got a small team of, you know, two or three founders who want to build something and they're raising maybe half a million or a million dollars to sort of uh, start hiring a team, start proving this concept works. So that's very early stage, super high risk. Most of those are going to go bankrupt, but super high return. You know, if you happen to be the angel who invests in Google, you're going to get a thousand times your money back. So that's angel. You get a little bit further along in the process and you move into what's called venture capital or VC. And there, you know, there's different stages. The earliest stage is seed round. Then you've got A, B, C, D, E, and so on. As the companies get bigger and bigger, their valuation gets higher and higher, but the risk goes lower and lower. Um, and those, you know, uh, angel people often do themselves. Uh, and you know, I would only recommend doing that if you have, you know, if you work in technology or biotech or robotics or something like that or AI, and you know people who are starting these companies, you have a lot of confidence in them. That's a great way to do it. If you don't have as much access there, I probably would go light on that. Venture capital is more traditionally done through venture capital funds. So, you know, you can think of a lot of big names there like, you know, Sequoia or, um, you know, they're, they're, there's a million of them um, and often have a very good historical track record. And those are the ones they're putting money into companies that are usually growing quickly. They have some degree of proof that their model works, but they're not yet at scale. And so they're giving them, you know, millions or tens or hundreds of millions to basically scale up and, and reach their opportunity there. Again, it's still risky compared to investing in a public company, but it's a lot less risky than Angel, especially the further down the trail you get uh, into these late stage series C and D and E. The companies are fairly proven and mature, but you still have um, some upside there. Um, a third one is private equity. And basically what private equity does is they're not looking to turbocharge these smaller companies, but they're buying companies that are you know, usually uh, fairly mature companies. Um, sometimes they're very profitable. Sometimes they, you know, have some dents and scratches on them and need to be fixed up. But they're basically buying mature companies, and they might take them private. So a company that is publicly traded, they'll take it private. Um, like if you think of Twitter, uh, that being example of a company taken private recently, or they might just be buying them from, um, you know, the guy who started it or a previous private equity firm that bought it. So buy it somewhere in private market transaction. And their idea there is they'll usually put in some amount of their own money, maybe you know 25 or 50% of the purchase price, and then they'll borrow the rest. And their idea is to run that company uh, better and to throw off more cash, and then eventually after maybe you know five or seven years to sell it to somebody else. Those tend to um, also have very good historic returns. Often in the, the you know if you think of VC maybe having you know in the 20 uh, percent plus returns. I think private equity, often the good ones can get uh, in a similar uh, return range there. 
And again, that was almost entirely done through a fund or a third party. Unless you happen to be somebody with an enormous amount of money, you can't personally take a company like this private, but you can invest in you know, some of the big names or companies like KKR or Blackstone or Carlyle, um, some of the better known private equity uh, funds that, that hold many billions of dollars. And then there's one other actually really interesting class of, of, of uh, equity alternatives, which is search funds. People don't know about this as much, but it has one of the highest returns actually of any asset class uh, out there historically. Stanford does a lot of studies on this and they've been tracking it for more than 30 years. And over that period, the average internal rate of return or IRR, just the average return on money there has been above 30% almost consistently every year um, over the past three decades. And basically the search fund model is that someone typically a new MBA graduate from some high-end school like a Harvard or a Stanford MBA will spend a year or two going and looking to find a small company to buy. And they will get maybe half a million or a million dollars of backing from a number of investors to pay their own salary and pay their expenses as they're looking for this company to buy. Then after a year or two, they've identified the company, they buy it often from the person who started that company. And then they try and scale it up or run it, uh, somehow improve it for five years or so. And then they sell it on to often to another private equity company. And this idea of basically buying it at a relatively low multiple from the founder and then improving it and selling it at a high multiple to uh, a follow on private equity company has just almost like clockwork returned unbelievable returns. Um, this one, you know, the flip side, and this is what I was talking about in general, where alternative assets can be low information, hard to get into, but then really good. I'd say search funds tend to be an example of that really good. It's hard to get into, but if you find a good search fund sponsor, um, you can you know, see those kinds of returns. And, and that's some of, if I look at the deals that we have done within the Long Angle community, that's probably some of the ones I'm most excited about are those uh, search fund opportunities. Um, so we talked about sort of a class of equities. I think there's also a class of commodities. You know, Examples of that could be crypto. That's probably one of the most accessible alternative assets out there. If you're looking at a major coin like you know an Ethereum or a Bitcoin or even you know anything in the top ten, top you know twenty, you can go buy that on Coinbase or really any uh, marketplace for crypto, and and you're going to get basically the exact same thing. You don't need somebody's help to uh, buy Ethereum. You can go just do that yourself. Um, and you know another example of commodity might be like uh, whiskey, and this is something that uh, we've done a few deals in recently. I've found really interesting where. There has been a pretty consistent um, appreciation curve where newly distilled whiskey that's just put into the barrel, or maybe I should say like Kentucky bourbon to be more specific, will often be about maybe uh, $1,500 a barrel. And then when it's three years old, it's usually worth more like $3,000. When it's five years old, it's worth maybe $4,500. And there's been this just very consistent and rapid appreciation curve. And you know, don't want to spend too much of people's time to talk about exactly you know, why that curve has existed there. But that's an example of something that you know I never would have thought of before. This idea of okay, I'm buying you know a, a barrel or you know shares of a hundred barrels of uh, newly distilled uh, Kentucky bourbon. But if you look historically, if you have a, a good operator there, you can consistently see these you know really pretty exceptional rates of return. And I won't say that that is totally uncorrelated. You know, assets, especially in a down market, tend to have some degree of correlation. So when it's a bad market for public stocks. Probably art, probably real estate, probably whiskey, probably everything's going to get hurt to some degree, but it's not perfectly correlated. You're going to get some benefit of, of that lack of correlation. Um, so commodities are another example. Um, then there's a whole set of things that are just around kind of complex financial structures where basically there's some stream of money or some asset that someone then wants to structure in a certain way and uh, sell on to somebody else. So I'll give you a more concrete example. There's something called equity finance where if you have someone who's lucky enough to be an early employee at a company, maybe it's like a private company, but that's been quite successful. So think of like a SpaceX or a Stripe or you know, some, uh, some private company that, that now their shares are worth, you know, let's call it $10 million. If that person, um, they may actually want some liquidity from that, but it's not a public stock today. So uh, they can't just go and sell it you know, through their brokerage account. One thing that... And also to actually realize the value of that to a stock option, um, to get a little bit into the weeds, a stock option, if I actually want to turn it from an option to ex uh, so-called exercise it or turn it into a share, I have to spend a certain amount of money called the strike price to actually say, okay, maybe this share is really worth a dollar, but my option is to buy it at 10 cents. 
well, at a million shares, I need to now come up with $100,000 to buy those shares at 10 cents. I know it's a great deal because they're worth a million, but I still got to find the $100,000 and I can't necessarily sell them for a million here. So, so what do I do? There's something called equity finance where a third party will go give that employee the $100,000 and tell them to use it to exercise these shares. And that in return for that, you can negotiate however you want to, but they will get some fraction of the upside on it and some you know, uh, shared downside on it. So if that million dollars of share now doubles to 2 million, maybe the person who put in $100,000 to allow the person to exercise their options, maybe he or she gets 50% of the upside and the other 50% um, goes to the employee. So you know, uh, th- those are just illustrative numbers. But this idea of a sort of structured financial arrangement where I'm putting in money to get a certain claim on a certain asset. There's an almost unlimited number of these. You know, there's also things called secondaries. So basically, anything that's in a fund, whether it's a real estate fund, a venture capital fund, a hedge, um, any kind of fund where there's not day to day liquidity, where you can't just go to the venture capital fund and say, I want my money back, because they'll say, well, too bad it's invested in private companies. I can't give you your money back until those companies go public. I can turn around and sell it to you, Chris, and say, hey, Chris, I want to sell you my stake in this Sequoia fund here. And you know, I think the underlying assets are worth a million dollars. Uh, typically, these secondaries will have a discount, and you'll say, "Well, I'll give you eight hundred thousand for that million dollars of of shares in Sequoia." Um, and you know, this is again across any of these asset classes, this idea of secondary transactions at a discount to the underlying value um, is a very common uh, form of of uh, settlements. There's even more esoteric things like buying somebody's life insurance policy from them and assuming the premium when they pass away, you get the money. Um, yeah, I haven't done that particular one uh, myself, but that'd be another example of structuring something. And then finally, you've just got a whole grab bag of sort of esoteric uh, approaches you can take. So just talk about you know a couple of fun ones. For example, there's a professional athlete revenue share, where let's say somebody uh, you know just signed a minor league contract and uh, you know they don't have any money right now. They're making very little on that. But they're likely to become, you know, the next uh, next major leaguer and sign a very big contract. But it's going to be quite a while out because they're going to be in the minors for three years or five years. And then the way contracts are structured, the major leagues is your rookie contract lasts another five years and is not worth that much. So they could be ten years out from their high earning potential. You could say, okay, you know, I'm going to give you hundred thousand dollars, and in return, I want two percent of your salary. Should you make the majors? If you don't make the majors, you know, I've lost my money. You got hundred thousand dollars. You know, that's the risk for me. But if you do make it, and I get two percent claim on it, if you sign a hundred million dollar contract, now I'm getting a you know two million dollar payout there. So that's just you know example of again uh, how almost anything uh, can be an alternative asset. And where do things you know? Art, farmland, do those fall in one of these buckets also? Yeah. I mean, I, to this point of, you know, almost anything you say, is that an alternative? And the answer is going to be yes. I think, you know, something like farmland, that probably falls into your overall world of real estate. And I would analyze those deals the way I'd analyze any other real estate deal. You know, you've got to, I think that's probably a low risk, low return version of real estate. It's pretty predictable yield. I'm going to rent it to a farmer for a few percent a year. And, you know, it's probably just going to slowly appreciate the, the sort of, uh, jackpot for farmland real estate is if you happen to be in the path of urban sprawl. And so, you know, like there's, na- I live here in Dallas, there's a neighborhood north of town called Plano that 20 or 30 years ago was cornfields. And now it's all, you know, 10 to 15 story skyscrapers. The guy who owned a ranch there did super well. Um, but that that's kind of what farmland looks like. You've got these things, as you're saying, like art, like watches, and probably crypto is like this as well, where there's not really an obvious measure of what's the intrinsic value here. Um, you know, is a Picasso worth a dollar or is it worth a hundred million dollars? It's really only worth what somebody will pay with it. There's pay for it. There's no cash flow stream there. Um, so in those, I mean, I, I personally have not gone heavily into any of those uh, collectibles. You know, trade baseball trading cards would be another example of this. I think you know the ways you can do well there is. Either you can just look at this as a hobby and say, hey, I am really excited about owning this cool you know, Rolex watch, and I don't really care if I've, quote, lost money and can't sell it because you know, that's something I'm excited about owning. Like you know, my wife's wedding ring, I have no idea if that's worth more or less than I paid, but I really don't care. We're not looking to sell her wedding ring. We just like it to be a wedding ring. And so I think there's you know, things like, and art, again, you, know, you could pay a few thousand dollars for commission a piece of art from a local artist. You're probably not going to make money on that, but the point wasn't as an investment. The point was to have it. Um, I think if you're looking at it as a pure investment, 
I would say this is really a case where you have to know what you're doing. I think there's you know the old apocryphal story about the poker player where if you don't know who the sucker at the table is, it's probably you. Then I think that could be very true in uh, collectibles markets or art markets where if you don't know what you're doing and are just sort of buying at the price that's given to you, I think there's a you know if you have fun along the way, that's great. But I think your odds of making money as a non-expert in something like art are probably pretty low. You mentioned at the at the outset. The reason you set a kind of threshold for long angle members is because they have to meet some requirements, you know, whether that's a qualified, I think, customer or, or even I know in other cases, there's a credit investor. Are those things always going to be the minimum and someone who doesn't meet them? Is, is there any accessible way to partake in a lot of these alternatives? I know it's two questions. So maybe we could talk on who, who, who's even eligible for this. And, and then we can move into how would you even go about evaluating it or finding it? Yeah, great question. So as you said, two things. First, who can? And then second, who should? Um, I think in terms of who can, it really depends on the asset class. Um, you know, the, As you said, there's sort of accredited investor, which basically means you've got a six-figure income or you have a million dollars. Then there's some higher thresholds like qualified client and qualified purchaser. Uh, qualified purchaser is actually a very common one. That's the highest level. That means you have $5 million or more. Um, so there's certain there's a lot of you know the most interesting ones you have to be a qualified purchaser and you know you can't get in if you don't have that five million dollars of investable assets. I think there's also a question of hey you shouldn't be putting you know ten or twenty percent of your portfolio into any one of these you know they tend to be more volatile and you or maybe volatile is not the right word you know risky you want to diversify across them the same way you shouldn't put ten or twenty percent of your money into a single company's stock, you should diversify across stocks. Same thing, you should diversify across alternative assets. So if you're talking about putting 1% of your portfolio into something, you need to have enough money that 1% is going to be a meaningful investment. If you know, 1% is um, you know, $100, then no good sponsor is going to want to take your money. It's not worth your time thinking about it. There can be some complex taxes with 1099s, and it's not worth the administrative burden. So I think typically this range of low seven figures of having a million or two million, or certainly if you have five million, it's definitely plenty to play. But I think that if someone has maybe a hundred thousand dollars, I would probably not yet go into alternatives. Um, I think the two exceptions I'd make there: one, as I said, crypto is a very accessible alternative. You can put in as little money as you want, and you know there's very good information about pricing. Uh, you know I don't know what a Bitcoin is inherently worth. But I have as much information as anybody else does about what it's inherently worth. So I think there's nothing wrong with dabbling in that. I also think angel investing, if you happen to have friends who you you know, know and trust and respect and think that they're very successful, you can, uh, angel investments are often small dollars, you know, $5,000 into um, and relatively small dollars compared to some of these other ones. So you don't need an enormous amount of money to you know, make a bet on you know, your roommate from college if you think he's going to start a very impressive company. But for a lot of the other ones, I think it often needs to get into you know high six figures, low seven figures before the administrative burden is worth it, and before uh, the good sponsors of these funds will be interested in, in talking with you. Having spent a lot of time in venture capital, I'll push back a little and, and share one stat. I believe ninety five percent of all the returns in venture capital are derived from the top three percent of funds. Uh, so you know. I've always been someone who, as much as I've played in this space and even professionally invested others' money in startups, I have been very reluctant uh, to angel invest, mostly because I think, you know, what, what do I, I... I've started companies, they haven't all worked. Um, I have friends that I thought were smart and those companies didn't work. I feel like it's just a very hard game where you have to be willing to lose all the money. The one place which you, you aptly pointed out that I think is... The one place where I will consider writing a small check in a person's company is if it's a person I just know really well and I believe in. Um, but I will say I've also had enough reps working at, investing in, and meeting people who start and raise money and build companies that I feel like my barometer for someone who's great is, is adjusted for what, what it takes to also build a big company. And I think that if you had asked me 15 years ago, which of my friends were awesome and I would want to back, I'm not sure I would have picked the same way I would now. So, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm probably the person that sat by the sidelines more often here. And I'm sure I have, you know, at least a handful of friends who didn't and, you know, have hundreds of thousands or millions or tens of millions because of it. 
And there are certainly early stage deals that I remember, you know, I remember lots of people trying to write early stage checks in Uber and, and it wasn't even, it wasn't even something that crossed my mind and that turned out really well. So I'm a little bit more risk averse in that space than, than I think maybe, maybe you are. Um, but maybe, maybe I'm a little jaded from living and breathing it and, and feeling like my real estate's, you know, in the Bay area tied to tech, my jobs that I've had, my jobs, my wife's had are all tied here. So I think that's another factor to consider is if you work at a technology company and your spouse works at a technology company and you live in a place where, you know, technology is a big part of, you know, the neighborhood or, or the city you're in, um, thinking about diversifying how you invest a little differently. You know, if you're getting paid in Facebook stock and your spouse is getting paid in uh, a startup stock, maybe tech is not the place to invest. So I just want to flag a few of those um, before and then get your reaction to there are a bunch of platforms online that let you invest in um, you know, both alternatives as we've discussed, but also things like private REITs um, and real estate funds that aren't, aren't public, wine, you know, that kind of stuff. What, what thoughts do you have there? Because I think many of them have made it almost ex- as accessible as you know, buying crypto um, and, and, and not something where you're necessarily going direct to a fund that has a higher threshold. I'll start with the, the disclaimer that I do not invest through any of those platforms. And I'm both happy to share what I see as the pros and cons and can share you know, how I go about it personally um, to the degree that may be helpful to some of your guests. So um, as you said, there are a huge number of these uh, you know, crowdsourced investing platforms to whether you want to get into wine, venture capital, farmland, private equity, et cetera. There are crowdsourced platforms um, for you there, fine art, et cetera. Um, I won't get into the sort of pros and cons exactly of each specific one and like their fee structure, but I would say generically, I think the biggest advantage of this is it does allow you to get access to an asset class without you know needing to have personal relationships with the partners at those firms and without being able to write six or seven figure checks. You often the minimums will be five thousand or ten thousand or twenty thousand, not you know in some cases five or ten or twenty million to get into um, some of the best funds. So it definitely gives access and it democratizes that access and brings down the barriers to entry. Now, in terms of what I would say are the downsides and the reason I don't do it personally, there's two of them. Uh, I think the obvious one is that there are extra layers of fees on it. Um, And I think there's nothing inherently wrong with those fees. You know, They are providing a service. They have real costs. I would just caution people to make sure that they truly understand the, the fees of what they're looking at, because often there'll be an advertised fee of saying, okay, you know, we take... 0.75% per year of assets under management, something like that. But what they won't necessarily disclose is that there's also certain administrative fees being paid, or maybe the asset that went in there, they purchased on the open market and then marked it up 10% and then sold it into their fund. There's certain things like that, which can actually make the fees a lot higher than they first appear to be. So you want to just make sure you really understand the fee structure of those. The second thing, and I think potentially the more important disadvantage and reason I don't do it, is that there's a selection bias. Now, you know, you said earlier that if you look at venture capital, you said something like 90% of the returns are driven by the top 3% of funds. That's going to be true across a lot of these asset classes where the top 5, 10, 25% of the funds are driving all the returns and really skewing the averages. And you're going to have adverse selection almost universally where I would be shocked if you're going to find Sequoia as a venture capital fund offered on one of these platforms. They're not going to have the very top tier uh, funds there because those guys are much more careful if there's access. Again, if you want to get into search funds, the good search funds are probably any search funds are not going to be on there. It's just not an asset class that sort of uh, is looking for, uh, quote, retail investors. And I think that selection bias is going to cause you problems because if you're expecting that venture capital returns 20 or 30% a year, then you slice off the very best part of that, what you're left with, the venture capital you can actually get through these crowdsourcing uh, platforms is not going to have nearly those same returns. You won't necessarily lose money and you'll get some exposure to the asset class, but it's not going to be the same sort of profits there. You know, you're seeing the deals that couldn't get funded uh, by the more connected private investors. Um, to share that, you know, that sounds like a negative story. And so I'm not saying this can't be done. Uh, I'll share the way that I do it is I think basically the most effective ways to do it via networking Now, I personally, that was actually part of the reason I started Long Angle is I was interested in getting into a lot of these asset classes, 
but I didn't have the network. There's some things I knew well. You know, I'd start a software company, so I do do know other people who are starting software companies. I can do that angel investing by myself. I maybe even know some VCs and can do the VC investing. But I don't know anything about mineral rights, and I don't know guys who are you know buying acreage in the Permian Basin and that sort of thing. You know, I didn't have uh, the right first person connections at private equity funds, search funds, etc. Um, so. You know, the way I do is actually, it's all through the long angle network where basically, um, you know, we've got a thousand members every day. One of them is sending me a deal uh, with and a thousand members with very different professional backgrounds. So in every one of these industries. So there are people who, you know, if you're interested in AI and ML driven, you know, crypto trading strategies, there's people who that's part of their whole job. They start funds that do that. So they're both seeing access to them that, you know, they send them um, to, to me or, you know, one of the other guys who's helping manage the community. We then pick out the ones we think are most promising. And I think in addition to the access, you want the evaluation. So we also get a volunteer deal team of three or four people who really know a particular asset class well. So for example, we were looking at one that was around tertiary oil field rejuvenation um, through oxygen injection, and it was fairly technically complex. So we just got a team of three or four members who were all petroleum engineers by background. That team did you know, a deep dive on it. We ended up passing because we sort of you know, weren't confident with the technology of it, the point being that it was both sourced by somebody who worked in that industry and then evaluated by people who work there. And so that's how I've done my private market ones is that the handful of ones where that deal team likes it, and I would say this is only one to two deals a month across a variety of different asset classes, we then create uh, a special purpose vehicle or SPV, basically a fund uh, within our group where anyone in the community who's interested in investing, everybody's making their own decisions, but they can read the deal notes and you know look at the calls and talk with uh, the guy running it. If they like that fund, they can then choose to put in um, a little bit. And we're, again, we're able to bring down the fees or the sort of minimums uh, because collectively making that investment there. So that's how I go about it personally. Um, now I realize that only works for me because I'm within the network. Uh, you know, if somebody joined the community, they could certainly participate there. But I think this is also extensible to people who are not in our community. We're saying leverage your personal network. And I don't think you have to invest in every one of these alternative asset classes. I think it would be a lot better for you to say, hey, there are one or two or three of them where either I have personal expertise or I am good friends with somebody who really has expertise here, and I'm going to leverage that person's connections and that person's expertise, as opposed to saying, hey, I just think that you know watches are a really cool asset class, and I don't know anything about watches, and I'm not going to take the time to learn it, but I'm just going to throw some money at it. You might make money, but you're likely to lose money there. So I would focus on fewer asset classes where you really can get that you know, first degree um, network yourself. I totally agree. And full disclosure, while I've signed up for many of these platforms and played around, the only one I actually use is Masterworks. And that's because I like the idea of investing in art with a small part of my portfolio, but certainly didn't have the assets or the expertise to do it myself. And I was okay with the fees, especially when I felt like they were doing something more than just charging for access to a fund. But yeah, the whole alternative space is something that for a while I just kind of was excited about. There weren't a lot of platforms to do anything, um, you know, 10 years ago. So I was just kind of learning and I kind of did what you did, which was pick an industry where it was technology and, uh, you know, dive into it and understand it deeper and feel like I understood the companies and that and, that, and then worked in venture capital. And, and even with all of that, I'm still pretty hesitant when it comes to angel investing. So you know, it doesn't mean you have to do it, but now I have enough knowledge about that space that people ask me questions and every now and then someone will bring a share a deal or something that makes sense. And I've heard the same thing is true with real estate. I've asked lots of people, how do you find all these great real estate deals? Because every, the number one thing I hear when I ask someone about real estate deals is they seem to always say two things and they're like the most stressful two things to be paired with each other. One is, gosh, real estate deals are so great. I've made so much money on real estate deals. And oh, by the way, 90% of the, all the real estate deals are terrible and you're going to lose money. And I'm like, okay, well, so, so I basically decided I have two options. I can either really try to understand the real estate community, understand what makes deals good or bad, meets people that can help guide me through that, or I could just steer clear. And so for me, real estate has been one where I just haven't been involved, but uh, you know, the opportunity to go to real estate investing meetups and meet people and understand they're out there. And I know that if it, if that was one of the asset classes I wanted to get into, I could. Um, it just I've it hasn't been a an exciting passion of mine, and so I'm okay missing out on all those deals. And um, th there are probably a handful of deals that are going to come up in Long Ale that I'm more interested in now than I was before. So I'm glad we got to talk about it. Yeah, I, I would agree with you that I wouldn't put pressure myself to invest in an asset class because I'm going to miss out. 
if you put all your money into an S&P 500 index fund, keep it there for 30 years, you're going to do fine. There may be an opportunity to make a little bit more by doing certain well-selected alternatives or mixing them in the portfolio, but I would not do it at the expense of stretching and investing in something that where you, you know, don't understand it or don't have the access or don't feel like you can really evaluate it. And, and it's funny because in advance of this call, I went and looked, I filled out the benchmarking survey uh, and I went and looked at mine. And it's like, even despite my passion in this, even despite all of these deals that come up on the platform, I'm at, you know, it, I think it was like 88% of everything that I have is in public, is in equities and, you know, my primary residence. And of the 12% that's left, it's like half split between cash and, and alternatives. So if, even for me, uh, with all the exposure and knowledge and some of the access, but but certainly not not as much as you have, it's still something that I try to keep down to the kind of sub ten percent part of my portfolio. And you know, the vast majority of it, eighty five percent of all of that equity is in index funds. So for me, as much as this is exciting and interesting, and I like to think about it and dabble in it, and maybe that'll grow over time, I I just want to make it clear that. I, my passion and excitement about learning about it is certainly not commensurate to its its position in my portfolio. So that was a like a masterclass on alternatives. But I am curious about another type of financial education, which is how you're thinking about sharing all of this knowledge with your kids. Because mine right now at two and five months, you know, we're not really talking about it a lot. Um, uh, a guy I know, Rob Phelan, has this awesome book called M is for Money that we bought for my daughter. So. It's like an alphabet book, except each page is talking about an aspect of money. And my daughter knows that the piggy bank has money and that the money buys things. And that's about as far as we've gotten. You're further on the journey. How have you thought about trying to make sure your kids both understand all of this and, and are equipped with the knowledge? But also, you know, I went to a conference recently and there was a group of people that said, how do we, how do we raise kids that you know, aren't entitled? And have you thought about that? And what are you doing? Yeah, I, I love this question. And you know, of course, I'll start with the comment that I don't have all the answers here. But if I look at myself and actually all the members of our community, I'd say, what is the number one problem that most of them are struggling with? It's this question of, as you're saying, what's the right way to, to raise kids in regard to money? And, and I might put that into two groups. You know, one, you talked about how to make sure you're instilling them with the right values and you know, not to take things for granted, not to be entitled. And then the other one is just practically how you get them sort of the information and knowledge uh, about it. You know, in the world of not being entitled, uh, don't have a full answer there, but a few things. I think one, in general, I would say that communication and honesty and transparency, I think is the best way to go. So my kids are a little bit older. They're seven and 11, and we've been trying to do this throughout. So in terms of making sure they, they value money, you know, of course, they can see that we have a nice house. If we want to go on vacation, we go on vacation. But my wife and I are transparent when we talk about decisions we're making. Like, you know, our, uh, we bought a new car recently and my son was asking, well, you know, why didn't we get a luxury car? Why did we get a Hyundai? And, you know, is that we didn't have the money for it. I said, you know, we could if we wanted to buy a fancier car, but that's just not important to us. And, you know, other things that we spend our money on are more valuable to us. And, you know, I used actual numbers with him. Of, okay, here's how much a Mercedes would cost. Here's how much the Hyundai costs. And, you know, this one seems nice to me. They both get from A to B. So just this idea of communicating, no matter how much or little money you have, there are trade-offs, you know, whether it's whether to buy the coffee at Starbucks and make, versus making it at home versus, you know, do you want to fly private versus do you want to fly commercial? You know, I personally have not moved beyond the idea of flying economy. I can't get my head around flying first class. So the kids actually, it demysticizes it. They see this is something that mommy and daddy talk about and they think about these trade-offs. And I think that kind of gives them exposure to it. Um, you know, in terms of how to sort of educate the kids um, on money and, you know, how it works is something where I wouldn't say that we've done a lot of things right in parenting, but this is one where I feel like we, we have done a pretty good job of it. I think the fundamental thing is your kids are interested in everything that you're interested in and everything you do. So again, my wife and I just talk transparently, you know, about our jobs. And, you know, when I'm looking at an investment here, I will put it in words that will make sense to a seven-year-old or make sense to an 11-year-old. But I'll tell them, hey, you know, we're looking at this whiskey aging fund and here's how it works. You know, you're buying stuff that this factory makes and you're holding on to it and you think you can sell it for more for later. And does this seem like a good deal? And asking them, hey, you know, what would you be worried about on this deal? You know, how do you think it might not work out? Why do you think, you know, why do you think it does make sense here? So I think that just that open talking about it of, not having money be a taboo. You know, uh, our son was asking about, you know, how we bought a house and how we decide which one to buy. 
And we didn't make up numbers saying, okay, let's pretend a house costs $100. We talked about the actual prices of that because you know they are sooner than we want or realize going to get access to the actual numbers. So versing them those real numbers um, is super helpful. And then the other thing we've done is actually just tactically in the world of investing, um, each kid, as soon as they were born, I opened a brokerage account for them. So this was separate from their 529 college savings, but just a brokerage account to buy individual shares of stock. And then for every birthday and Christmas and Hanukkah, you know, they each get to pick out one stock that they're interested in. You know, it starts when they're little kids, like, okay, how about Mattel or how about Disney or something like that? And I just print out a cute, you know, goofy looking stock certificate and I think that's semi cool. But then, especially my son, now he's 11, has gotten older, you know, he's expressed interest in this. And so we will actually talk about particular companies and, you know, say, hey, your birthday's coming up. What do you want to look at? And, you know, it depends. Sometimes it'll be he wants to, a share of stock in the company where my wife works or something like that. And sometimes he'll want to actually, you know, say, well, which one's growing faster and, you know, start to do, you know, a, a junior version of analysis on them. And it's not like this is his passion. You know, he may show no interest in it for two months, but then the brokerage statement will come. He'll look at it. He'll read it. And the cool thing about kids is if he's getting 75 cents in dividends from some companies, like, wow, I just got 75 cents I didn't work for. You know, for a grown up, you might say, hey, who cares about the 75 cents? But for a kid, actually, those small numbers are an exciting amount of money. And it's a way to sort of start getting them that exposure there and they can get those little wins. And they actually then see that continuity where a year from now and two years and five years, he's seen those same shares that he got you know, for his third birthday. Now it is eighth birthday or his 13th birthday. He's seen those there. If he puts on dividend reinvestment, he's seen those numbers get bigger. And just sort of, at least for him, I saw this light bulb go out of these dividends. Hey, I didn't do anything. And now I got this money here. I think he sort of gets the value. Uh, we also nudge them in that direction where they get an allowance and we give them the option of, hey, you can spend it on whatever you want to. You know, It's your money. It's your choice. But if you donate to charity, we're going to match that 100%. And if you invest it, we're going to match that 100%. And so, you know, the kids, they spend some on trash, but I would say most of it they choose to donate or invest and they see the value of that 100% investment and it gets it compounding pretty fast. I've also found, especially as they get older, it's been a nice discipline tool. You know, you know, every parent discipline is such a challenge. You lecture them, you give them consequences, timeouts, takes things away, et cetera. But for a certain class of misbehavior, this can actually be really effective. So my son and I were at Boy Scouts, um, you know, a couple of weeks ago, he was throwing around his Boy Scout book and he accidentally threw it up in the rafters and it got stuck there. And so I was, I mean, like, so frustrated with him, like, like, why'd you do that? You know, it's going to cost $25 to buy a new Boy Scout book. And then I realized, you know what, Jack, you got to spend the $25 to buy that Boy Scout book. I told you not to throw it around. You knew that was the wrong thing to do. It factually costs twenty five dollars. We can look on Amazon here and saying getting you know a new book is costing twenty five dollars. That's coming out of your account there, and so that was I would say you know it was a very fair consequence. It was just a natural consequence of what he did, but it really reinforced it. He has not done that same thing again when he realized, hey, I have to pay out of pocket for this. And of course, you know if he destroys our sofa, we're not going to charge him you know thousands of dollars for that. But you get these sort of small classes of things where you can actually just make them more responsible, at least with material things, by making them live with the consequences when they act irresponsibly. I like it. I feel like I got a lot of thinking to do before we get there. Um, I will ask in case you've thought about it, have you thought about or have you thought much about college savings and 529s uh, you know, versus just keeping something in a, in a little bit more liquid, less restrictive place? Yeah, I looked at this a lot when they were born, and I've just sort of put on autopilot since then. The math I did when they were born was basically if you put $1,000 a month from day one into a 529 plan, assuming some reasonable rate of return, that's going to more or less cover the cost of college when they get there. You know, since that was seven, 11 years ago, it's probably a higher number today. Maybe it's 1200 bucks that you need to put a month into that. But I just started that from day one, and those accounts have been building up. I think the you know downs the upside to 529 is they're great from a tax perspective. You put the money in untaxed at the beginning, but basically it grows untaxed. The dividends are untaxed, capital gains are untaxed, and when you take it out, as long as you're spending it on education, and there's a very broad set of things that count as education, there's no taxes ever when you're taking it out. So it's it's great there. The only quote risk is that you actually overfund it, and maybe your kid doesn't go to college, or they get a full scholarship, or they go to an inexpensive in-state school, and you've got too much money in there. I think it's a really pretty small problem. One reason is that you can take that money out and just pay a penalty, but if it's been compounding for 20 years, you've probably done better than the penalty anyway. Or, you know, if you're fortunate that you've got 
um, extra money and there's money left over in there, you can always just repurpose that to a new beneficiary. So in theory, you could make your grandkids the beneficiary of that. And then you've done your, you know, your kids' college savings um, on their behalf for them. Uh, and so I, I have probably overfunded what we need to have in there, but just in the idea that, you know, those, um, the downside is pretty small and the upside of not having to worry about it um, is, is pretty significant. Now that's, um, you know, there's other things you can do in terms of also putting money in trust for your kids and five and, uh, you know, UTMA accounts, et cetera. I wouldn't say I have the exact answer there, but for the 529s, I think just picking a number and consistently putting in every month is, is kind of a no brainer if you can afford to do it. Yeah. Someone sent me, I can't even remember the name of the website, uh, or I'd share it, but, uh, this guy who basically teaches a course or does consulting. I can't quite figure out whether it's legitimate or or kind of fraud's the wrong word, but I can't figure out how legitimate it is. But it's a it's a bunch of hacks and, and a series of tactics to basically offset the cost of college. And it seemed like it was kind of asset location meets scholarship eligibility and financial aid and all that kind of stuff. So I, I'm thinking of doing an episode on college savings in and of itself and and I'm trying to do some research now. But uh, so stay tuned if I learn anything interesting. And if I don't, then that means there's not really any 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 interesting tactics to learn from. Yeah. And I will say if you send your kids to private elementary school, you will question why you're saving for college. It you know, costs it just as much to send them to a private elementary. You know, fortunately our kids are going to to a public school now, but when they were uh, previously going to a private school, I really questioned why there was all this hoopla around it when it costs just as much uh before that. Um any any other, but before we wrap, you know, that was kids. Are there any other areas of life, um, things you've picked up, tactics you want to share, tips, hacks before we take off? I think one that does not work for everybody, uh, and I don't personally do this, but if you can make it work, there's a huge upside to is having you or your spouse become a real estate professional. Um, and what that means is whoever is a real estate professional needs to spend 750 hours um, or more and at least half or more of their kind of business hours doing real estate. Um, it's a pretty broad variety. It can be, you know, a contractor, a real estate agent, managing your properties, et cetera. But if you do that, then all of your paper losses on real estate are actually deductible against your ordinary income. So if you have one spouse, you know, say your wife is a lawyer earning a lot of money or a doctor earning a lot of money, and you can qualify as a real estate professional, you can actually cancel out her income with your uh, kind of paper losses on real estate. Um, so I don't know that I think this is good public policy, but if it's something you can do, I think it is, uh, it's a real um, savings for your portfolio. I know you love all this stuff. Uh, this conversation has been great. We've had other ones before. Are there other places online uh, that you consume content? You know, you've got Long Angle, you've got uh, this podcast, of course, but what other resources, sites, blogs, people you follow to stay on top of all of this? Yeah, for sure. Um, you know, there's a couple uh, websites I like. I Mr. Money Mustache. I'm sure you're familiar with. A lot of your listeners probably are. Uh, he was one of the ones that initially got me into uh, this idea of you know a lot of the investing and you know I guess financial hacks. Um, it's you know fairly different from some of the stuff I do, but I find him a very entertaining writer and uh, a lot of interesting content there. Um, there's also the uh, Fat Fire Forum on Reddit. Uh, which uh, Mr. Money Mustache is all about extreme frugality. Fat Fire is more around financial independence, but spending a lot of money. So between those two, you kind of get a yin and yang of it. Um, in terms of podcasts, th there's probably three uh, that I really like. Uh, one is the Odd Lots podcast uh, by a couple of the Wall Street Journal reporters. Um, it covers different economic topics in, in a really good degree of detail, sort of like yourself. Um, there's one called Money for the Rest of Us um, that... Again, he'll pick sort of one, um, you know, in generally investing uh, concept or asset class and really go deep on it for half an hour or so. And I, I've learned quite a bit from that one. Um, and then there's one that may, it won't appeal to all listeners, but it's called the business of family. And especially people who are in a demographic of having a family office or a family company and, you know, having um, quite a bit of assets in, in uh, some company like that. Uh, he every interview every episode he interviews the sort of person leading one often multi generational family company and talks about what they do to pass you know values and wealth and practices and other things on uh, across generations and how to run these family companies. I'm not exactly personally in that situation, but I just find it you know fascinating to uh, hear uh, what some of these very successful families have done there. So th those were three that I would point you to. Great. 
And then, you know, you know this already. We always end up uh, asking you to pick a place that you're pretty familiar with and share a few recommendations, something to do, eat, drink. What, what's your spot? Uh, so I live here in Dallas. Um, I've lived here about seven years. Anybody who talks to me knows I'm basically the Dallas Chamber of Commerce. I love it here. So I'll, uh, I'll talk about a couple of things with Dallas. I think, you know, if I were looking at a really nice day in Dallas, I'd probably go for a walk down the Katy Trail, uh, which is our rail trail here. Uh, there's a nice place called the Katy Trail Ice House. Uh, there's not great food there, but the atmosphere is awesome. And, you know, one of those places where you can get a margarita the size of your head. So that, that's a fun kind of people watching on the trail. And then um, where I'd probably go, what might surprise people about Dallas is the symphony here is actually phenomenal. I, I'm not a very cultured person and, you know, not historically into the arts, but we went one time to the symphony and I absolutely love it. We became season ticket subscribers after that. Uh, the concert hall was designed by IM Pei and apparently it has top 10 acoustics in the world among symphony halls, given uh, the way they, de they designed it. Um, so uh, I'm, we definitely recommend that anybody who has a free, you know, Thursday, Friday, Saturday night here in Dallas, uh, checks out the symphony. This is awesome. I really appreciate you being here. Where can anyone, uh, listening that wants to kind of check out more of what you're working on with long angle, where can they go? Yeah, I'd, I'd, uh, love to hear from, uh, any of your, uh, any of your listeners here. So best place to find about Long Angle is just on our website, longangle.com, or feel free to uh, email me directly. It's T Fallows, um, T F A L L O W S at longangle.com if you want to drop me an email. Um, as I mentioned, you know, in terms of people joining the community, uh, we do have the qualified client threshold. So it would be um, any of your listeners with 2.2 million or above in investable assets is sort of the uh, the threshold. Um, for the community there, but uh, anybody who wants to join who's in that demographic, I'd love to have a conversation with you and you know see if it uh, seems like a fit. Um, yeah, so that, that's how to find out more. Awesome. Thank you so much for joining me. Well, thanks so much for your time, Chris. I really enjoyed this conversation.